All right, we're about to get started with our next talk. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Paul King, Dr. Paul King, uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, testing and Groovy. So please welcome Dr. Paul King. Thanks. I was uh, going to try to explain uh, my talk in uh, one sentence. And if you were here earlier in, the, in this session, you, James would have told you how to have less Groovy in um, your, uh, in your workflow uh, definitions. I'm going to tell you how about more Groovy everywhere else. So uh, that's, that's, that's not quite true. But um, in fact, even though I've got Groovy in the, uh, the, the title of this talk, it's not essential that you've, you know Groovy at all. It, it does, um, Groovy happens to run on the JVM, um, can run on JavaScript and other things as well. But it's not even essential that you're a JVM programmer. The, the, the real message of this talk is how to automate testing using scripting of some kind. And what I want to do is to show you some, uh, I'll show you a little bit of Groovy, but I'll show you some interesting techniques that, that you may not have thought of if you are trying to automate uh, testing. And um, I guess I've, I've had a, wore, wore a lot of hats in, in my life, and um, I've been involved with lots of testing and agile stuff, as well as a whole lot of developer stuff. And f for me, where this is pushing is to try to make tests more accessible, uh, make them more usable, make them uh, first-class artifacts within your uh, sort of a build environment. But we'll, we'll get that as we go. So, yeah, I guess the, the first question you might ask is why test with Groovy? Well, I'd kind of say, well, um, and it's yep, working. Uh, it's kind of the wrong first question. So I, I'm not going to try to sell you on Groovy or whatever until I know uh, about the people that are going to be involved in the, the development and testing within your organization. So you need to go and find out what their backgrounds are, the, what, the, what their skills are, and, and so on. So if you, if you look at that first, you know, are the people who are going to be writing tests, are they developers? Will they have the skills to use uh, hardcore programming languages or scripting? Or are they, you know, if we ever get them to even use a spreadsheet, that's probably um, the highest we could probably achieve. Ask all these questions first, and then you can go and um, have a look and see. Uh, what kind of tools and languages might, might be applicable. So the nice thing about um, Groovy is that uh, it is very easy to learn. If you've got a whole bunch of devel developers who are, um, uh, if you're in a Java shop or whatever, they can pick up Groovy with almost no, no learning curve. But you can, at the same time, you can actually write tests in Groovy that just look like plain English if you want. So sort of RSpec or Spec2 or whatever, depending on what uh, flavor of... Uh, TDD or BDD uh, testing framework that you might be familiar with, you can do that in straight Groovy and get IDE support if you want. And I uh, haven't got a lot of examples of that, but I can elaborate on that if people are interested in. Um, the disadvantages, uh, the best way to run Groovy is on the JVM. So if you, if, you, if you hate the JVM for some reason, then Groovy might not be for you. And if you've already got Ruby or uh, Python developers, then you can probably write very, very similar scripts to the ones I'll show you with a similar sort of sets of tools available to you, and, and you don't need to um, have a JVM there or learn uh, Java or Groovy or anything. OK, so there's a few more slides here that are sort of generic. Um, the, basic, the basic message is, is that I'm, I'm going to encourage you to be using scripting and uh, uh, tools that are in DSLs or whatever that um, I'll, are amenable to being treated as first-class citizens. So we, we have got a big history in the development community of treating our source code for the development side of our source code as pristine artifacts. We check them all in, we version them, we've got all these uh, tools that will give, allow us to analyze whether we've got good quality artifacts and so on. And by the way, we also do a bit of testing, and sometimes we forget to do all the same kinds of things that we do for our production code with all of our tests. The reality is, if you don't do it for your tests, you might as well throw them away because they, it's going to become brittle and a nightmare and um, a maintenance nightmare and it's not going to be of value to you. So you need to um, certainly at least give some uh, lots of thought to your test artifacts as well. Now there's a whole range of uh, other things that come into play. Um, if once I start using a programming language, and Groovy is a scripting language, but it's a programming language that can piggyback on Java for a lot of things, and I can start using the same language across all the different tiers of testing, unit tests, integration tests, functional tests, and so on, and I can start using the same sort of life cycle, the same sort of tools for checking that I might use for checking duplication, 
in my production source code, I can use those same tools for checking duplication uh, in my test code, which is a, a if, you're, if you've ever maintained a very large test suite, you'll know that it can be a big problem uh, when you go and change things. If you have a huge uh, test suite, your agility gets reduced. When you go and modify features in the production code, you have hundreds or thousands of tests that you need to go and refactor. So by using scripting and uh, not using pointy clicky tools or not using sort of ad hoc approaches to testing, a lot of the things that you've done before uh, can come into play, keeping, uh, allowing you to be agile with reasonably large test suites. Although, like the previous talk we saw with property-based testing, there'll be techniques that we can use to reduce the test suite without reducing coverage. And there's um, also mentioned, even though I've said that um, you can use the same tools, you'll often not want to apply the same rules when you're treating test code and production code um, when you're analyzing them statically or whatever. So you might have, if you're a Java programmer, you might have um, check style rules. Groovy's got a thing called CodeNARC, which is a, a basically a way to statically analyze how, how uh, good the uh, quality of your code appears from a static point of view. If you're doing, running those same set of rules for testing as for production, you're, you're probably not gonna do what you wanna do. Uh, you're not gonna, uh, achieve what you want to achieve. To give you one example, one of the things that we try very hard to do uh, in our production code is reduce duplication everywhere. So if you've got some sort of functionality, put it in one place. Then if you want to change the functionality of your system, there's one place that you go to and, and make that change. If you refactor your tests to have the exact, um, to, to follow that same principles, you'll often end up writing tests that don't look like what a business analyst um, would exp how they would express the test. And often the way we as humans will e express a test in some sort of specification form in a, in a fairly declarative way, will have lots of duplication. And I can go and refactor those out, but it turns out to um, then turn the, the, the look of those specs into something that doesn't uh, gel well with your business analysts or customers. So it's something to keep in mind. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways for handling uh, test data. So there's data, you can have data-driven tests, you can pull it out of databases, you can have property-based tests. I'm going to show you a model-driven way to do tests as well, which is something that some of you may not have seen before. And it turns out to be really handy in certain scenarios as well. I'll also show you um, using uh, constraint-based programming as a, a nice technique as well for minimizing writing lots of ad hoc individual tests that then become a, a maintenance uh, burden. And all, all of the things that I've been talking about are underpinned by having a scriptable, executable uh, uh, testing environment. So that's all to do with sort of maintaining the code. I want it to be scriptable. But I'm also going to encourage you to be using testing DSLs. Now, what's a, what's, when I've, some of you may not have not heard the term DSL. It's a domain-specific language. So Groovy and Java and, and C, C Sharp and so on, they're general purpose programming languages. You can write any sort of code in them. If I'm querying a SQL database, I'll use the SQL query syntax, which is a, it's a, it's a much more con constrained or it's a domain specific language. So it's a language specifically for querying a database. So I can't do as generic uh, f while, you know, while loops, and if loops and things in SQL. There's a f little bit I can do, but it's not a general purpose thing. I can't write everything I want, but it's very, very good at querying uh, relational databases. So Domain specific languages turn out to be nice when you've got a particular problem set and you want to uh, do testing in that particular uh, uh, environment. And we tend to do that a lot when we're doing our testing. So we will end up creating a domain specific language that's using the nouns and the verbs that your business analysts are familiar with or your, the customer, whoever the customer of the system is familiar with. And we'll write our tests and they'll look like little English sentences and um, yeah, Groovy happens to be very, very good at doing that. In its, in its early days, it, it uh, allowed DSLs to be written that were very, very dynamic in, in nature, so very much like what Ruby can do and Python can do. Um, it, uh, in more recent years, there's been a big push to allow you to write very statically typed uh, domain-specific languages as well, and I haven't got time to go into the, the details of that, but you can actually write domain, you can write tests that look like little simple English uh, sentences but get 
full static uh, type checking done on those uh, sentences and get single stepping through your debugger if you're wanting to go use an IDE and so on. Or you don't even have to worry about IDEs, you can just add lines in a text editor and, and so on. So Groovy is going to be very good at doing that. I'll, I'll only show you a couple of examples. Again, this, is, this talks about just motivating ideas, trying to, to turn your brain cells on to try different things out when you're doing your testing. I'll also look at a couple of different other techniques. So as well as the property-based testing you would have seen uh, previously, I'll look at um, some concepts, all pairs and um, so on, um, and, and a bunch of other things we'll get to as we, as we go along. Now, the, there is an example that I'll use later on. Um, I don't really want to go into uh, too much of the details of this. If, if I could give a whole talk just on testing tools that are applicable in different domains, like if you want to go test a REST-based API or want to test a, a web application or want to test production code or a database things, I could um, probably give a full talk on any, each of those topics. Um, so I, I won't... Um, go into a lot of details, but basically when, when I'm working out how to test people's environments, I go and look at test runners. They're things that allow me my test environment to talk to different systems. I might have a test runner that can talk to a database or a web app or a, a REST API or whatever it might be. Then I'll have a bunch of these tools that let me do either property-based testing or all pairs testing or whatever, and I'll, I'll sort of put all these things together. I'll have various drivers and runners and things that let me write tests in a particular way, talk to various things in particular ways, and have a bunch of uh, ut utilities at hand to do very fancy things that reduce the burden of having lots of ad hoc tests. And we'll, we'll combine those together, and you'll, you, if you're using Ruby or Python or some other language, scripting language, you'll do the exact same thing. You'll just have different bits of technology f filling out this little uh, uh, diagram there. Now, as I said, today's not trying to sell you on Groovy. It happens to be an, um, a nice language if, you're, if you know Java, but you have got envy of um, things that might be in Smalltalk or Ruby or Python or, wh or whatever. Um, it, it adds in a whole bunch of those uh, features. It's had uh, first-class functional support uh, via closures since day one, so it's got a lot of functional stuff built in. A lot of stuff to do dynamic programming built in, and these days a lot of stuff to do stricter than Java static programming as well if you want. So if you don't like uh, Java's uh, type checking model, you can go and plug in Coq or Idris as your backend uh, for the type system, or Haskell as the type system for Groovy. Now I've done that experimentally, no one ever does that in production yet, but it's, a pl it's an extensible type system that you can all modify if you want to make stronger than Java type checking as well. So there's lots of um, nice things about Groovy. I've just got one slide to show you some examples of it, but it's not, not all that important what's on here. All the examples I'm going to show you in later slides, the details of the, of the Groovy aren't important at all. But, but the techniques behind them is what I'm trying to sell, and, and that's what I'm hoping you'll uh, take away. Just to give you a, a tiny bit of flavor, um, the f it's going to be very small font from those of you up the back, but um, in, in Java, you'd probably write something like system out, print line, hello world, and a semicolon. You can write the same thing in Groovy. So nearly all of Java, you can just cut and paste and run as Groovy. Not 100%, but most of it. Groovy will also let you just go print line and, and a string as well. It'll let you add types to variables or not. It'll let you have in interpolated strings. It'll do smart stuff with arithmetic. So it uses big decimal uh, arithmetic. So if you're dealing with currency, there's a lot of gotchas with the, the floating point and double points in, um, in Java and, and other languages, JavaScript and so on. Um, there's very few languages where you can go assert 0.5 equals a half. Most languages will fail with that. Um, Groovy will succeed, and that's what the bus a business user would kind of expect to see something like that. There's rounding errors and other things that most other languages will um, uh, trip up over for, for that particular kind of statement. Groovy does the right thing, but if you want to be, make it a big decimal and big arithmetic aren't quite as efficient as doing floats and decimals, you can turn it back to floats and decimals if you need to as well. Um, that's the, there is closures, which is first class functions. I, I, I won't bother going through the details of this, but there's some a code down there that's just checking that ant, b, and cat, three strings, come before dog uh, lexicographically, so al alphabetically. Okay, um, I guess there's um, 
the, there's some more uh, background here that depending on who I'm talking to, whether it's developers or testers, I sort of go into a bit more detail about what I encourage the different groups to do. I'm going to skip that today. And I'm also going to skip over some of the uh, next few slides fairly quickly. Um, if you were a Java developer and you were trying to understand how I'd start testing in Groovy, you'd probably be familiar with things like JUnit 3 and JUnit 4. And I, I'd explain to you um, good ways to, to do that. I imagine in the room today, we've got a whole mix of different people. Some won't know Java at all, some will. Um, so I'm not going to spend much time on there, but there is a um, very, very good support in Groovy for using all of the common frameworks in Java, uh, including up to Java JUnit 5, as well as TestNG, as well as, uh, as well as those which are used predominantly in the Java world. There's a homegrown Gro um, Groovy testing framework called Spock, which has got some really nice features for doing behavior-driven uh, development style tests. I'll show you one or two slides to give you a feel for what that is, but it's, it, the details aren't that important. Um, yep, so I'm going to just quickly uh, skim over a little bit of material um, about those frameworks, but um, here I've got a little, I'll, I'll, I will very briefly mention these because when I get back to property-based testing, I've got a little example of, of uh, how you use property-based testing for, for some of this. So I'll very, very quickly explain what's going on here. The details, I, I won't, won't um, what an import static is and stuff like that, I won't uh, dwell on those things. So here I've got a little, um, just, just a function that converts temperature uh, between uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius. So you feed in a temperature in Fahrenheit and it spits out the equivalent in Celsius. So there's a standard formula there. I'm sure you'll remember that from uh, school days. Subtract 32, multiply by 5, divide by 9. Um, that's, that's all fine. And there's some, uh, you, one, one of the ways you might test this is with some examples. So we talked about example driven testing before. So I can feed in uh, maybe freezing in uh, Celsius as zero. That's what should come out when I feed in 32 as the Fahrenheit value because that's what f uh, freezing is for um, Fahrenheit and so on. And there's other temperatures there that might be a, a good temperature to have a, uh, a, a barbecue in your backyard or a good temperature to go to the beach and cool off or whatever. So there's some different examples that are there. And um, Groovy th treats testing as such an important thing that you don't even need a testing framework. These examples don't use a testing framework. The assertions are built into Groovy and unlike Java turn, has, has assertions but turns them off by default. Groovy turns them on by default. So this is just straight Groovy without any frameworks or libraries or anything. If you go and install Groovy on someone's machine, they can just type those sorts of things in and it all, all the tests just uh, pass. There's another nice thing um, about um, Groovy's built-in testing, and it's, it's actually got a, um, a power assertion, it's called, which is it's, it's basically just a shorthand way of saying when something fails, it actually uh, displays a little bit more in detail about the, 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 the structure of um, what it calculated and what went wrong. And so for, if I fed in, on the previous slide, I said assert 35 was Celsius 95, which was the actual correct value. If I intentionally got it wrong and I put 34 on that bottom slide, when I run that, it'll say the assertion failed, but it'll also show me where in, in the, the hierarchy it, it failed. And it's pretty hard to tell from there how the value. But if I do a more complex case like this one, here I've got um, a, a sort of a mathematical equation involving cos and power symbols and so on. It actually spits out the values all the way through the, the equation so I can uh, tr you know, drill down and, and look at the different parts of, of this formula here and say, yep, that's what I expected in for that part. Here's what I expected for that part. Oh, this, why is the customer coming up with this value? It's, there's no way it should ever be like that. And you can drill down and, and know, just not, not, not only know, oh, it failed, but exactly where it failed because it'll, it'll appear in these sort of power assertions. So that's, again, a nice little thing that Groovy provides. Now, there's examples of doing, I showed you some assertions. There's examples of doing that with JUnit 3 and 4 and so on. I'm just going to skim over those, but needless to say, there's good support for doing all of those. And there's a JUnit 5 version. If you're into the bleeding edge, you can do all that sort of stuff. And I said that uh, there's a, a built-in, uh, a Groovy's got its own testing framework called Spock. 
If you've heard of a thing called BDD, Behavior Driven Development, or TDE, Test Driven Development, there, uh, again, it's probably, probably a whole talk, each of those topics could pos possibly deserve a whole talk themselves, but they basically encourage you to express your tests in a way that tease out the parts that are sort of assumptions versus setting up the systems versus the actual properties that you're really interested in. And um, you'll often see these uh, tests expressed in things like given some assumptions, when some certain things happen, then this is what I expect to happen. And even, as, even when you're writing your unit tests, forcing yourself into the discipline of split teasing out your tests into those three things actually makes your tests easier to read and understand from someone who's uh, jumping in and they can know what things you're testing versus what things are set up. It, it actually often, uh, t when you, if you force yourself to put it in this form, you actually learn a little bit about your system and um, you often will change your test slightly because you've written it in a such a way that the assumptions aren't clear and, and uh, so on. And, and doing it in this form is a good discipline that um, I encourage you to, to, to look at. And have a look at all the literature on TDD and BDD if you're interested in that topic. The uh, next thing that's often handy um, is doing a whole lot of examples. But rather than just having lots of individual tests, there's a concept called data-driven testing. And all of these testing frameworks uh, allow you to, uh, to do that in various ways. Um, Spock and JUnit 4 and JUnit 5 all have different uh, techniques for, um, for doing this. And some of them, are, uh, in, well, all of them uh, allow you to either specify the test cases as nice little, um, here it's, a, it's a, a list of um, values, so 0, 32, and freezing is a sort of a scenario that I'm, I'm a friendly name I've given to that test. Garden party conditions is the next one and so on. Um, so I can put them in as, as values or if um, in Spock I, it, it actually ends up being a little table um, and you can put that right in your test code if you're um, a developer who's writing these and you're, and you're familiar with this environment, or you can extract those out into little tables, CSV files or Excel spreadsheets or whatever if you, if you need to. Um, the nice thing about um, things like Spock is that you can actually get, even though I don't need to write lots of individual tests, when I run my tests, and I've made, made an intentional error in here just to show, show what happens, when I run this test it actually spits out individual uh, names for these tests that have been, they're generated names, and you can see that one of them's failed there because it was 34 instead of 35, that same uh, intentional error that we saw on a previous slide. And it's very, very handy when you're seeing your test results stuff to first of all see it in this form. If I'm showing a customer or a business analyst the results of my test suite, seeing it in a nice friendly form is very, very valuable, but also we, we, we get to get early feedback on um, seeing the actual things appearing in the in the test there rather than having to in the test name rather than having to drill down and look at the code and see what what failed. Now there's another thing that's very very handy. I'm not going to um, spend any time on it today, but um, often when you're so perhaps not for you or for some of your unit tests this will be this will be critical. Um, perhaps not for your functional tests, although even functional tests we sometimes have uh, mock web servers and things in play, but Certainly for all the, the inter intermediate parts of your system, uh, mocks can come into play. And this is where you can actually write a fake version of a, a component and do um, various kinds of testing. Spock's got some really nice, fancy um, uh, and pretty syntax for, for capturing these kind of uh, mock things. And um, here we've got a theater example. And once we run it, we're expecting in this particular example that one Lord of the Rings ticket get, got purchased from the theater, so, um, and we used some mocks in play and made that happen. But uh, I won't go into the details of that, but there's very good mocking support across all the different testing frameworks. Okay, there's, for, for Java developers, if you're ever using a thing called uh, Hamcrest or Fest or uh, Google Truth, there's some things you'd often do in Java. and If I was doing BDD or TDD in Java, I'd probably use one of these frameworks. In Groovy, it's a bit of an anti-pattern. Um, you use one of these frameworks because your language isn't powerful enough to express the constraint that you want. Groovy's powerful enough. The constraint that you want to express 
in your production code sh is, is just as good in your test code. So Groovy is powerful enough to capture these sorts of things without needing its own expression language. So you tend not to use those at all. So that's for your developers out there. Other people won't know what I'm talking about and won't be interested. So I'll, I'll continue on. Okay, I'm going to talk about property-based testing. So those of you who were at the last uh, session in, in this room would have uh, seen an excellent introduction um, ab about that. This is just my take on a little piece of it. I tend to use it a lot in testing across all the different layers. And it's, it's very, very powerful, but I don't uh, use it naively and I don't use it everywhere. There's, and there's particular um, cases where I think it's very valuable and other cases where I think you can easily um, make the mistake of assuming that because you've now got hundreds of test cases uh, being generated, you, offer, you can make the mistake of thinking that your system's foolproof and is doing what the customer wants. Quite often, by doing the, forcing yourself to do a certain number of examples, you hopefully put yourself in the mindset of the customer or the user of an API or, or whatever it is that you've got. Um, I've seen lots of uh, functional programmers um, that sort of fall into the, 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 the misconception is, oh, because I've now got uh, hundreds or thousands of tests happening with my uh, property-based tests, it's doing exactly what the customer wants. And so, well, no, you've written some properties here and you are the one who wrote the properties and the customer didn't validate those properties. So you're just checking that it's doing the things that you're expecting it to do, which might not be anything at all related to what the customer wants. But anyway, the, um, the prelude and um, what, what this is talking about is there's a bit of a testing game that you do when you're doing TDD that often doesn't get used in functional programming. So in, in TDD, uh, one of the catch cries is you don't write a single line of production code until you've got a failing test and so on. I could elaborate on that, but we haven't got time today. And if you go and uh, look at uh, people who are doing functional programming, they very rarely do this. And uh, one of the um, things that they do is they try to do properties instead because what uh, the, the little game that you play when you're doing agile testing with TDD, you've often got it's, a, it, oh, it's what we call gray box testing. You've often got a little view in your mind of what your uh, code's going to end up looking like. And you, you have that view in your mind when you write your TDD tests. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do this so that when I write the production code, it's going to look like this. And you'd argue that that's not necessarily a good style for, for when you're doing TDD, but um, when you're writing functions, very rarely can you look at the inside? So functional programming uh, encourage you very strongly to uh, not be very imperative in how you uh, build your code. And therefore, you cannot see inside the thing that you're creating. It's, it is a black box that you're expressing it in functional terms. You don't have a while loop or a for loop inside there that you can, uh, you're thinking of what's inside and how can I make it tick. So um, TDD won't be something that necessarily helps you as, as much when you're doing um, functional style programming and that's where property-based testing can uh, come into play. This is an example of a property-based test and here we're, we're working on um, a sum method for strings and we might think how am I going to test this sum method for strings? Well one of the things I can do is if, if I had some um, a list of words and I find out all the sizes of those words and then I sum them together, concatenate them all together, then um, the sum that I get, with, that's, that's a sum on numbers. I'm going to sum the size of the, the words together. So if I've got a word, of, a, a word of size 4 and a word of size 6 and a word of size 5, I'll sum that together and get 15. If I also sum the strings together, the 4 and the 6 and the 10, I'll get a 15 character string. If I find the size of that big string, it'll come out to 15. So both sides of this equation will come out to the same thing. And if that property actually turns out to be true, then probably the sum method I've got for numbers and the sum method I've got for strings that concatenate strings together are probably both working. So this is one of the things that you would typically do. And um, one of the questions that got raised here was, yeah, is, how do I actually, um, you know, let's, let's think about, let's think now about how we would use property-based testing for Celsius. So I'm going to uh, randomly generate a whole bunch of numbers for Fahrenheit numbers and feed them into my nu number and then what am I going to test them against? 
am I going to generate some random numbers? No, that's not going to work. I need the, I, what I need is um, some way to validate the numbers that are going to come back. And generating a bunch of random numbers as the input is, is of uh, little value to me, at least it first appears. And one of the, there's various approaches that you can take to this. One is you might go get a, find some sort of oracle that's going to give you the correct values. So if you've got a Celsius method in uh, um, a, a different library package, I can go call out to R or Python or something, and it's got a Celsius method, or I've written one before in Java and I'm replacing it with Groovy, I can go call the old one and see what it said. And if, if it gave me the same value as um, what my new one does, then I can probably get some level of confidence that, yes, the new code is probably doing the right thing. Now, it's not always possible to have an oracle, and I might not have any other way to do it. So what do you do? And this is where the very interesting thing from, from me um, about property-based testing comes into play. And it actually, you end up trying, um, in order to work out how to test this sort of thing, you end up uh, coming up with new insights about your system, some properties that actually hold in your system that you didn't really uh, beforehand think of it. Now, this one's a little bit contrived, but this is the kind of thing I've done in production code, and you end up with uh, properties that actually make a whole lot of sense to the business analysts or the customers. Now, in this particular case, what we're going to do is we're going to split temperatures up into freezing, uh, so liquid phase, uh, uh, frozen phase, and boiling phase. And, and I can tell you what the, the boundaries of those phases are for Fahrenheit and for Celsius. And what I can't tell you, I can't generate a random number to work out um, the, the value that's going to come out, whether, um, what it should actually be, because I don't have an oracle. But what I can tell you is, if it, boy, if it was freezing in Fahrenheit, when it comes out of this system, it better be freezing in Celsius. And similarly for boiling and for liquid, right? So what I've done is I've gone and found some properties. Oh, phase changes should be maintained through my converter. Right? And so if you're doing these round-tripping sort of things, um, look for the properties that might come out. You know, will I ever have null values in here? Will they get round-tripped? And, you know, and it, it, it might be that uh, they won't get round-tripped. And maybe that is a property that you actually like or don't like. Or, and then you go and uh, do your next steps. So here what I'm going to do is um, within a certain range of values between minus 40 and 240, if you graph uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius, it's in fact, um, they will cross over. And so the, below minus 40 degrees uh, and above 240 um, in, in Fahrenheit, the, 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 the properties that I'm going to test for won't hold. So I'm only going to test within that range. And um, I'm going to just test that property that it's yeah, phase changes don't get mangled up when I pass it through my converter. And so this runs it over 100 taste cases, but it um, could be anything you like. And um, we saw some examples of um, things in the previous talk, so I won't go into lots of details, but um, you end up writing little expressions like that that, that trigger properties um, that you've, are of actually real interest to you, and you'll use generators throughout it. And I've just got an example of some, some generators on strings and things, and the top one um, with re the reverse reverse string example we saw earlier. But there's another example here, and we saw, was it person, or I forget what you had as your um, domain object, but um, here I've got a person, and it's going to be a generated thing as well. And you can generate an, a, um, an ID between uh, 200 and 10,000. You can have a, um, what have we got there? So I, we can have different things for the, for the th different things that get generated. So I can have enum values get generated. I can have birth dates that get generated. I can have regular expressions that get used to generate the things. And um, you, can ha you can put in, if you're running a dating website and you found out that 55% you know, of your people who come are females and 45 are males or whatever, or other things as well, um, you can go and pre-configure uh, the, the random test data to look like what should be uh, coming into your website. Anyway, the thing is, it might, you go and do that, you do that once, and then in your little simple expressions, you just say, give me a new person, please. And you do properties between um, different people or between people and your other domain objects. And it, comes, it turns out to be a, a very, very val valuable thing. Um, so this is just some examples of, of uh, doing that using um, Spock and other things as well, which it ends up looking very similar. So 
Um, let's not go on. Um, so what I want to do now is just run through a, a case study that's testing a little web application, and I'm going to show you a few different um, to a few different things that are going to um, potentially make it easier to test this little web app. So it's a really simple web app. It's actually the whole the whole web app, including all the uh, domain objects and persistence layer and the web layer, is it's about 100 lines of Groovy and it's using GORM and other things under the covers, but it's, it's ugly as, but it's does not designed to be pretty. It's designed just to show you, give you some ideas. This is a little blog that the Simpsons use, and they feed in um, a, a person, a category, and a little bit of info, and then we're going, to, we're going to go and test it. Now, I've got some slides here that, um, oh, there's just one of the pages. So there's the new post page. You can see there's values where you can feed in um, a category, an author, some, some the blog, the, the, the text for the blog, and so on. And then it'll be it'll appear there, and it'll appear on the front page as one as an entry. Um, now, there's, again, there's a whole talk in what testing tools you might use in, uh, in in Java or Groovy to go and test that in a nice way. In the full deck of slides, which is like an hour and a half talk, um, which but it's the one, it's the URL that I gave you at the front. Um, you can go and look at how to do that in like 30 different testing frameworks. Um, there's, I've just shown one or two here, and then uh, I think I've got, if you're interested in any of those other testing frameworks there, you can go and look at how to, um, to go and test that, that web app. Um, it's, um, what I'm going to do now is, so one of the examples that I showed was, um, let me see, that's just using uh, Spock and so on. Um, oh, yeah, I, won't, I won't go in through the details. There's a few different um, web frameworks that I could go use. Anyone who's interested in those, come and speak to me. There's, I can talk about those to, for a while as well. Um, what I'm going to do now is say, OK, we went and found a framework. We went and tested the Hello World. We, we entered in one blog entry, and we're done. Right? Now, what other techniques can we use to now evolve a, a bigger range of test suites without creating ourselves a maintenance burden and potentially writing test suites that are going to look nice for our customers. So let's quickly run through some different tools that we might use. Um, one of the things you can just do is all combinations. So I can just say, now this is a contrived example. I'm going to check on, check on Mac OS, Linux, and Vista. Obviously, for this conference, it should be you know, SOSI versus CentOS versus um, Ubuntu or something. You know, we won't have those other operating systems here, but anyhow. We've got different uh, memory sizes and different hard disk sizes or whatever, just as a contrived examples. If you just go dot combinations dot each, it'll now find all the combinations of those things. And then I, I, the test method was the one that I ended up getting to at the end of the previous set of slides that showed it in a different number of examples. We've just uh, calling into the test uh, framework we saw before. But we're now generating a whole bunch of different values. And it's just going to go through all the different combinations. And it's much, much better keeping it in this little table here than actually going and getting a tester to, you know, I've, I've seen customers that go and hire a test, test people. The test people go and think of all these cases, and then they manually write, you know, 256 test cases that match the, the values that spit out of there. The thing is, you want to get later on, oh, we don't have two gig memory anymore, but we need 16 gig. You don't want to go and hire your test uh, people again to go and create another 256 tests manually. You just come and change one line of this, and the test suite just starts running the new values, because it generates all of those on the fly as it goes. Now, um, there's a thing, uh, as well as all combinations, which is, turns out there were 75 combos for the, the, the values I fed in, there's a thing called all pairs. Has anyone ever heard of all pairs? Yep. Do, do, do you feel up to giving us a very brief description of what you think it might be? Or, or well, you, you'll know what it is, but can you just summarize it easily? No. I can't either, but... Um, okay. Um, so, what all, what, as it turns out, bugs tend to appear in your system when two features interact in a way you didn't expect. So, it's the memory size the big memory size and the small disk size, when those two features interact, that's when the bug occurs, because we didn't allow ourselves enough space to store the database or whatever. Um, 
So rather than doing every single combination, all 75 of those combinations, we just make sure that each of the pairs appears at least once in the test suite. And it, the, there's a, a library that goes and generates those. So it turns out there's only 18 pairs. And so here you'll find that um, in our, this is our blog system now, instead of 70, 75 combinations, you'll find that food appears with Bart somewhere and somewhere else food will appear with uh, Maggie and food will appear with Lisa and so on. Uh, Lisa and so on. Um, the uh, author and, and, and so on, all, all the different things that we're interested in um, will, uh, will uh, get executed. And so each feature pair interaction will occur and we'll have a much smaller test suite. There's a, 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 a really neat uh, library for Groovy called Jeepers, which lets you do concurrent programming. So we can go and test that blog with a, with a bunch of, um, it's telling me about five minutes left, yep. With a, a bunch of um, uh, different combinations here and actually have different uh, parallel threads go and test those. So you, you can do that in whatever your favorite library is. Another technique that often gets used, is, uh, I've often used, is a thing called constraint programming. Now, this might seem a bit foreign to you. If you've heard of, if you've heard of Prolog or logic programming, or whatever, this, that's the area that we're talking about. So in this particular system, they've gone and analyzed the data that's coming in. And in this particular case, um, they find that the users of this blog never blog on the same day. Marg blogs only on a Saturday or a Sunday and so on. There's some constraints that I've gone and analyzed the, the, the usage of my system and I just feed those in as properties and then I go constraint solver, solve that for me. And like Prolog would go and solve things, these constraint things solve these things for you. Now again, you'll often go and pro hire an external testing agency to go and analyze your system and work out valid combinations of things and they'll generate some tests but, but then they'll go away and, they'll, and you'll lose all the insight as to to uh, what, how it was generated. We'll capture it as a set of uh, rules like this and then if, if, we, if Maggie stops blogging on a Tuesday but it starts blogging on a Friday, you just come into here, change one line and all of a sudden your tests get regenerated that factor that into it and it's, it's live. And because you're using a scripting framework, it's all there. And to cut to the end of this one, this went and generated uh, four valid sets of test data that complied with all of the uh, constraints that we fed into this system. So th think of this logic program as a nice way to minimize the number of uh, manual tests that you have to write but maximize the, the coverage in things that are important to you. The, um, I think this is the final one, I'm just about out of time anyway, but um, uh, another thing that we found very useful is, yep, I can't see how many minutes, two minutes, okay. I think this is the last one, so we're, get, we're, we're pretty much on track. Um, this is a finite state machine generator. And to cut along, it'll, I'll have to do this very, very quickly. Here we're feeding in a, a tw this is an American example. We're feeding in a quarter and then another quarter, or we can feed in a whole dollar or whatever. Um, and eventually, after we've fed in a whole dollar's worth of money, uh, out will pop something out of the vending machine. You can write a little finite state machine that captures that. In, this is in Groovy code. And then you can go and just say run please. And it runs that finite state machine and it passes things through all the, the valid properties. Now in our case, we, I'll jump forward to our little blogging app. What we did is we were worried about interactions on the website. So if you filled in your category first before the author, would that impact the web application? So is there some Ajax stuff go, hap, going on where the order in which you entered things in or the whatever differed? So we wrote a little finite state machine, it captured all that ordering con, uh, constraint information and then we just go go and we tell it how many things to generate and it went and, said, it, it went and generated a whole bunch of tests for us, which was which all those, and it actually then also gives us a coverage graph and we could, we could find out um, whether we've actually got full coverage or not based on a little finite state machine that we've generated in, the, in six lines of code there. And the final thing that I'm going to, uh, final slide here is, if I, I, I skipped over some of the stuff that was showing you how to um, write the actual tests. And in, um, I think this might be WebDriver. Uh, web, using WebDriver, that's what it looks like. Click link, label that set input uh, field that and so on. 
what we tend to do is actually move away from that and move to uh, testing code that looks like this bottom line here. Now, you won't be able to read that from the back from looking at the size of that, but it, say, it says post blog from Bart with title Bart Rules and Category School and Content Cowabunga Dude. And that's what our tests are in Groovy, and you can actually go and uh, type check that. Have full, if you're in an ID, you can get full type completion all the way along. You can actually um, do single stepping in your debugger and so on. Um, or you can just write it in a text editor. So there's some thoughts for things that you might want to do to sort of you employ scripting to give you a wider range of options when you're doing your testing. Okay, and a little bit of that's in the book if anyone's interested, but um, it's also applicable to languages outside Groovy as well. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>